Hi, this is Amy Austin. Welcome to A Time to Thrill. I am so excited to interview author Theodora Taylor, whose latest book, by the way, debuted at number nine in the Amazon Kindle store. That is no small feat, let me tell you. I, um, okay, so (laughs) Theodora, she and I both went to Smith. Um, I think she probably graduated like more than 10 years after I did. But um, I met her through uh, another author who actually comes up a lot, uh, a really good friend of mine, uh, USA Today bestselling author Maggie Marr. Uh, I don't know, Maggie and I were walking one day and she was like, do you know Theodora? You know, she's another Smithy. And I do know a lot of Smith alumni uh, in Los Angeles, but I never met Theodora. Probably I stopped going to a lot of alumni events. I don't know when or why, but um, it's been a long time actually since I attended one. Um, but uh, when I come came out here, um, I had a friend who uh, had lived in my house um, at Smith and she introduced me to a lot of people. And then there were always like the alumni events over like in Hancock Park or the South Bay or something like that, but it's been a long time since I've done any of the alumni stuff. Actually, that's interesting. I'll have to think about that. Anyway, Theodora um, is a best-selling author, like super best-selling, like no joke, of uh, interracial romance that she mixes with sometimes sci-fi, sometimes time travel, sometimes shifter, um, all of those things, but she is really masterful at storytelling and um, her readers love her. She's got rabid, rabid fans. And also, I'm sure you will have noticed that a lot of other authors talk about Theodora. And she has done a couple presentations, um, which we'll talk about in the podcast uh, over the last few years. And um, she is sort of has an amazing like laser focus on what makes a story work. Um, She's also like super well read. So whenever Theodora gets into like a topic, she'll read like, I don't know, like 50 books on the topic. And then I'll be like, well, what are the good ones? And then she'll give me a list and then I'll read those. Um, Especially there was a year, like maybe 2018, uh, 2017, I think, that she was like into uh, organization and the best way to like manage workflows. And that introduced me to actually some great titles about exactly those things, um, which is knowledge that is great. Um, I use every day and I carry forward in my life. So I can't wait for you to hear this talk uh, with Theodora. Um, I miss her. She left LA, uh, during COVID. Um, not that I would have seen her that much anyway, but, uh, you know, I just can't pop by. (laughs) Um, actually I should tell you this, like one day we were like giving rides to each other. I don't know. We'd all gone to lunch, uh, out in Woodland Hills, um, at, uh, actually a restaurant owned by, uh, Maggie Moore's husband. And we, uh, had come back and so Theodora's like, in my house, like getting a ride. She got a ride for me and then she was going to get a different ride, uh, to her house. And, uh, my son like runs downstairs and he was like, who are you? (laughs) And I think she introduced herself. And at that time he was into, I don't know, random science experiments. So at this point he, when he should have been in bed, so he's in his pajamas, his hair is a mess. He runs downstairs, he goes to the pantry and he pulls out his latest science experiment and shows it to her. Um, she's the mom of three kids and she really indulged him because, uh, if people will come to my house and talk to him, he will talk their ear off. Um, but it was just kind of a sweet exchange and, uh, I really appreciate her for, uh, humoring him in whatever he was into at the moment. Anyway, without further ado, here you go, Theodora Taylor.
Hi, this is Amy Austin, and welcome to A Time to Thrill. Today, I'm so delighted to talk to author Theodora Taylor. Um, I hey, have- <laughs> How are you? I'm so good. How are you? Um, it's so good to talk to you. I, okay, so let me say this. Um, so I've known you for years, but I will say that I think in the last four or five people I've interviewed, everybody has talked about you. Oh, uh, wow. Seriously? <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not joking at all. Like, so last week it was, oh, I'm going to get this wrong. Lisa Huey. Um, oh, Lisa. And then before that, oh, I'm so bad. Mia Hopkins. Um, and then, okay, I can't go back before that without uh, thinking too hard. But, <laughs> but every talk, I mean, every, that talk that you did um, at Romance Author Mastermind, I think profoundly affected so many people because that's, what people are talking about, the universal themes, universal story, and how it's changed how they think about both reading and writing. That's amazing to hear. I'm so happy. I was so nervous before (laughs) that um, speech came out. And it's interesting to record it first, and then you just send it in. And you're just like, (laughs) you think of a thousand things you want to change as soon as you push that send button. So it was really lovely to have people um, respond to it the way they did, the way I wanted them to, which is, you know, never guaranteed. So that that makes me so happy to hear that it's still resonating with people. So much. I mean, I was talking to Lisa, well, last week, and she was talking about how it has changed her understanding of why some stories resonate more with readers than others. Um, and she was like, we were talking about some story, I don't remember, um, or romantic suspense, because that's what she writes now. And she was like, but some resonate with readers. And I'm like, why do you think that is? And she's like, you know, Theodora said. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's like, I think it must hit on some sort of universal story or core story that people like really can respond to and relate to. And so it's changed. I think she was saying what she might write going forward. Let me not speak for her, but more or less. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. It's interesting. I was re- reading a just super well-written um, sci-fi fantasy the other day, and it hit on so many universal fantasy- fantasies, and it was super well-written. And I was just kind of like, oh, what a trifecta. I don't know what the th- um, third part of that triangle is. But- <laughs> I, I need to figure that out. But the well, well-written, well well-crafted, and oh my gosh, um, so many universal fantasies just popping off inside of it. It was really great to read. It was just a great experience as a reader. Okay, you have to tell me what the book is now. You can't oh, it, was just... a, it was A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah Mass. People have been telling me to read it for oh. literal years. I, I've heard nothing but good things about this book. Um, a friend of mine, another Smithy, finally said, you know, you got to read this book. I want to talk with you about this book. And I was just like, fine, I have a couple of weeks where it's lighter, I will read the book. And then I was completely enthralled. Like if I have to push back my next pre-order and read it for a year, I'm writing Sarah Mass a personal, a very angry letter. <laughs> How the series just locked me in. It was terrible, but wonderful, but terrible, but wonderful. Oh, I know that feeling. This is so interesting yeah. because I've yeah. not been reading fiction much, mainly because my life has been too complicated to exactly. even have a yeah. minute. But um, I miss that feeling so much. <laughs> it's funny because, you know, especially as writers, we get so caught up and so busy mm-hmm. that it's really easy not to read. Right. It's like, so it is. it's like, well, I have my own stuff to write. And then there's, you know, some guilt when you actually do make time to read. Like, and also, you know, I'll be quite frank, it feels almost like work because it's just like, well, what am I learning here? What what should I um take from this author? What can this author teach me? And the like. So it's really nice when a story for me. I think that's why I read mostly outside of my genre. Mm -hmm. It's so nice when a story can just take you away, voice (laughs) off and say, well, you're not going to write about fairies anytime (laughs) soon. So you can just really enjoy this Game of Thrones meets fairies book. That's so interesting. Okay, there's so many things I want to ask you. So one of the things I will say for listeners is that um, Theodora and I both attended Smith College. Um, she graduated a thousand years after I did. Um, I mean, there was no, 
you know, I graduated back in the Stone Age when there weren't even electronics. So. <laughs> if I ever interview Sarah McLean, I'm going to say, still be Fox. I'm going to steal that line. I'm like, well, Sarah McLean um, graduated a thousand years before me. <laughs> um, but I, I think about you often. Well, because we didn't attend at the same time. So, no. but what every so often it comes up, especially a, because of the Jessica Brody. So, I don't, I was talking to a friend who is a movie director who is thinking about writing a screenplay, different conversation. And I was like, oh, are you a save the cat guy? And he was like, what are you talking about? And I was like, let me tell you about the world. But then when you and I and some other people were talking, I didn't realize there was a save the cat writes a novel book that Jessica Brody had written. Right. Um, and she's a smithy. So then I was like, okay, well, I'm going to read it. Smithy, just a lovely, yeah. lovely person. Um, so Jen LeBlanc do- dropped it off at my house, actually. And so um, <laughs> and I need to return it. Um, and that's on my list of things to do. But um, so I did read that. But then right after it, um, have you read? OK, so, you know, Maggie Mars. So she's reading this book yes. called, called The Teenage Brain. Oh, wow. And, I'm not there yet, but. <laughs> well, I'm preparing ahead of time. <laughs> I know, that's smart. I got to get I, I can't be because her kids are older. I can't be I can't come late to that party. <laughs> so I'm, she was like, read it now. I was like, OK. Um, So I finished it last week and I was like, the author name kept like niggling at me. I'm like, why does it sound familiar? Why does it sound familiar? Why does it sound familiar? But she won the Smith medal. Um, Wow. So she graduated before I did. And um, she's a doctor, um, an MD. And she, well, she does neurological research, obviously. And I was like, the name sounds so familiar. And then I had to text Maggie. I was like, oh, she won the Smith medal. I I must have read it, but you know, in and out. And I was like, oh, there's a lot of Smith women doing stuff, doing stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's always funny because it, 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 because I'm never surprised. It's like, oh yeah, of course, of course, of course. that's a that person's a Smithy. Um, so it's been a, in the sort of well, the zeitgeist. So it's in, been in my house. I guess I also went to Smith and write books, but in my head, I'm different. So I was well, just like, there's it's a so lot funny because of- you're so Smithy to me. <laughs> like, <laughs> A lot of the reasons we get along, you're super articulate, you know, your, you know, your uh, mind. I'm not an artic- I'm not an art- articulate Smithy, but yeah. as a group, they tend to be articulate, oh, like super so articulate. Funny. Can I really express their minds? Have, you know, uh, very, I, I don't, I wouldn't even like very solidified viewpoints that they can express clearly and the like. And, you know, whenever I'm just confused about anything from the age of 18, when I first stepped on to Smithy Co- Smith College, right. Smith College campus, it's just kind of like, well, I should ask a Smithy friend. Literally, I was just um, talking to my best friend, who's a Smithy. And um, I, w- I had a question about this private school. And she was like, oh, you should ask Dana Brown, this other Smithy, <laughs> who's, who knows everything about getting into private schools. Uh-huh. So it was really crazy. Oh, that is so interesting. So I'm going to be honest, like, I don't see myself as a Smithy. I mean, I know you don't have to be honest. You've said that several times. Because I just feel like I'm like an alien and they are all these people. But I I, sometimes to other people, it is reflected back to me, especially when I show up in the cashmere (laughs) sweater and pearls that perhaps in Southern California, no less. And I I always, I did it last weekend. I was like, here's my cashmere sweater and here's my pearls. (laughs) And they're like, and you don't see yourself. I'm like, but this is just okay whatever so um it is what it is i i but i i hear what you're saying because i have a friend actually um a smithy friend amy who i she and i email and whatever all the time and i was like okay i need a thought on this and like i email her right away she gets absolutely that. and i was like oh thank Ask you for smithy. just thank you for telling because it's so it's clear she's like here's a succinct paragraph on mm-hmm. what on this thing and i'm like that's what i wanted to say <laughs> And if you have to do something like move or anything, chances are there's a Smithy who will have, like you said, kind of like an Excel spreadsheet or something, right? Like step by step directions as to how to do it. And they're always, in my in my experience, very happy to tell you exactly what to do. It's like, no. Oh. No, and I find it, I'm not going to lie, I'm going to find it super helpful. So even when I moved to Los Angeles 20 years ago, those are the first people I contacted. Yeah. Um, and I still talk to them now, but those are the first people I'm like, okay, I need X, Y, you know, Z, A, B, and C. And they're like, here, 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 and here. And it was just like, well, that's easy enough. Thank you. 
<laughs> well, it's funny because I need a lot of taking care of, care of. I'm a complete space case. <laughs> so I need so much nurture and taking care of. <laughs> it's just kind of like, can, are you a nurturer? Are you a take your care of? And, you know, can you do practical things? I need you. And so at this point, it, it, so Smith was perfect for me. I still have so many deep, deep friendships from Smith specifically because it's just like, wow. This is, these are women who are super capable. They, you know, they, they're, in my, in my opinion, they tend to make great mothers <laughs> and the like, which I need. <laughs> so it's just kind of like, and they're just, they just really know their stuff. So mm-hmm. I'm very trusting of Smithies, no bias, but mm-hmm. not me. Like, <laughs> If anyone's listening to this, it's like, I should ask Theodora Taylor something, but like, no, <laughs> I, I love that about Smith and I appreciate that about Smith, but I don't necessarily represent that for Smith. I will say I do have a spreadsheet for everything. <laughs> I do. I mean, I have a, I have a, like a bullet point checklist for like house hunting, one for apartment hunting, one for absolutely, everything. Absolutely. Absolutely. Although I do sometimes feel like Smith it, being so having so many smithy friends has enabled me not to do that so it's just kind of like i would have a spreadsheet except all of my smithy friends already have made a spreadsheet i can just oh. ask them for their spreadsheet as, as i come upon my midlife i have decided that i do not need to reinvent the wheel ever again i mean i mean yeah. ever so if somebody's already done it then thank you Thank you. Yes. <laughs> and I can, I can do something else with my energy to be, to be honest. I mean, I think it's one of the most grown up things I did. Like I don't need to redo it. Like, okay, so you just tell me what I need to do and I will go do it. And thank you. <laughs> Isn't wisdom fun. I'm really, it's so convenient. That's what they don't tell you about <laughs> wisdom. It saves you all sorts of time. It's convenient. It saves you money. It's wonderful. It, uh, it I, I just said this to somebody else. Cause she, she recommended I read a book. Actually it's called, um, Never Split the Difference by Chris Foss. Oh, about, I love that book. About, I, I read it a super long time ago, though. Oh, I read it last year. And I called her back and I was like, I want to thank you. Look, I, and I had to spend the $20 on Kindle or whatever it was. And I was like, you know, my eye, my eye almost popped out of my head. And I was like, this better be good. But it saved me, I swear to God, hundreds of thousands of dollars in the last yep. few months. And all I, could, I like called her, I'm like, I can only say thank you because I would not have had this wisdom otherwise. Yeah, it's funny. Um, my best friend was one of the people, it, it, the first, it, it was probably the first person I ever heard this from, but she had this thing that she had learned when she was in grad school, where it was just kind of like, oh, if you get a new job, wherever they offer you, ask for more. Right. And, you know, I, and she's made me ask for more on during crazy situations and most of the time they give me more it's crazy (laughs) so it's just like thank you for that it's i love things like that i love hacks maybe yes although i somebody last week said that to me and they're like you got to ask for a discount and like i'm the person who will ask anybody and it was just one context where i hadn't thought about it and i still haven't done it but i'm like the worst i could get is i could be where i am you know it's just one of those things I have I have a hard time asking for discounts for whatever oh, reason. I usually don't, but it's a it's a big one. So I'm gonna yeah. have to I'm like marshalling my forces <laughs> to get to get to the get get the the wherewithal to do it. Um but first other things. So I have about a thousand questions for you. Um what okay. What did you read growing up? Oh, romance novels. It's so funny. (laughs) um, It's interesting. I was just talking to another writer about this the other day. Like the 80s were kind of, my kids feel sorry for me because I didn't have Netflix. Oh, I know. Or an iPad. God save us all. (laughs) Yeah, or iPad. I wasn't always entertained. I was just bored a lot. But the nice thing about the 80s is moms, or at least my mom, or at least a lot of the moms of romance writers around my age should not police what their kids read. Nope. (laughs) Nothing. I read so much V.C. Andrews. Um... You What's know, a little it, incest between friends? Right. I loved it. <laughs> Roman Joanna Lindsay. Um, oh, oh, Susan Elizabeth Phillips. Ooh, um, Jude Devereaux. Like all, 
all the <laughs> all those big romance queens of the 80s and 90s mm-hmm. um julie garwood i could really go on judith mcnaught oh. <laughs> it's I funny know. i actually know their names i can't tell you how many great books i've read and it's just like ah I yeah i know that book. what was that person's name who wrote it but you know and like anna green gables right <laughs> and little women and so it was really in the color purple so it was just kind of like it, it was it, it was a great childhood because it was just kind of like whatever was accessible and good mm-hmm. i read oh i have so many questions because i read julie garwood i went through a julie garwood phase and um okay how can i say this i read a lot of romance but i'm older than you so romance was a lot more chaste and then one day it wasn't <laughs> right <laughs> And you're like, what happened? The world has opened up. But Julie Garwood, I think, had the most sex of any books um, I read back then when she was writing. I've only read her historical. I never read her contemporary. Yeah. Um, But I also found out later that a lot of people read historicals because those had sex. And when I was reading contemporary, they did not. And I didn't know that. If I knew that. Oh, yeah. Like like literal bodice rippers. Yes. (laughs) I had no idea. If you're wearing a bodice, it will get ripped. (laughs) At some point during this book. I, so I would have read differently had I known. I mean, it, I was limited to wifey and waiting for um, Harlequin to like turn up the heat with like Temptation and Blaze in the early 80s. Um, oh, wow. And that was, but before that, it was lots of chaste kisses and, uh, or punishing kisses or, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> depending on, depending on how that was going to go. You know, I, 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 I'm falling in love with you, but I never talked to you. I hate you. A lot of those books. I read so many. Well, you know, that's, it's funny because the bones of romance is still there there's right. still a lot of unhealthy um <laughs> <laughs> it's like i love you but i will never tell you exactly I, i'll act like i hate you but i really love you secretly yes <laughs> so many of those and i was always it, i had so many thoughts as a kid i was like but what i want to say is there was something about it so even though i probably recognized that that was not necessarily how i would want my life to go there was something right. compelling about it that i put that down and picked up the next one well it makes for an interesting book like it's basically it, you know if we're going back i don't i hate quoting myself but if we're going back to universal fantasies mm-hmm. i think it is really wonderful in general to see a couple who's not communicating mm-hmm. start to communicate by the end of the book. Um, a more recent example of that is Bridgerton, which I just right. loved. And uh, spoiler alert, <laughs> they're not communicating at all <laughs> in the beginning. There are so many misunderstandings and the like. And what saves the day is them both finally kind of learning really good communication, mm-hmm. which and it felt so satisfying because you were just like, oh, not only will this couple have a happy ending but they're communicating so it felt very real and i love watching that progress but if you have to like you in real life it's kind of great if you come into a relationship the whole person (laughs) yes able to communicate right but you know it's more that's not as interesting of a story to watch as two people who can't communicate who redeem themselves and fix themselves and become two people who can communicate. I just love it. So can I ask you, what was it about romance that pulled you in as a child or a young person? You know, I don't know. It's interesting having three kids because (laughs) Um, one of them is super interested in boys and really loves all things romance. One of them is kind of neutral on it. And one of them is like, I'm never getting married, you kissing. And it's just kind of like, I guess the love of romance is really there from the beginning. And for whatever reason, I just really love love from the beginning. I'm always one of those people who, if I'm watching a movie, I'm way more interested in the love story, what's going to happen, who's going to get together, than I am in the action or any of that. (laughs) That's so interesting. So would you say then that, would you consider yourself a romantic? I am. I'm deeply romantic. And yeah, 
<laughs> so yes, like, yes, I'm romantic, which is interesting because there are a lot of really, really good romance writers who aren't necessarily like, oh, in real life, I believe flowers and rainbows and right. everybody, you know, with enough communication that everybody can find love and that love is the greatest thing. But it's one of it. it I'm shocked that you asked me that because no one else ever has. <laughs> but yes, I'm deeply, deeply romantic. That's so I believe in love. I think some of us are very cynical. Uh, <laughs> and I will leave that there. Yes. Um, so what, okay, I have a thousand questions, but how, okay, I feel like in the years I've known you, the kind of romance you are writing has shifted um, to some degree. I don't know. But it felt more traditional in the beginning. I don't know if that's the mm-hmm. right way to say it. And now it feels darker more esoteric I'm trying to think of the right way to say it I should have thought this before I asked the question but have you noticed a shift in your writing from the first romances you wrote to now well absolutely it's interesting because when I first started out it was a super tentative thing it's just kind of like oh I'm going to try to write a romance novel and it's kind of like I'm learning to write a bike and it's just like well I think this is where you put this and this is where you put that and this is how, and you know, I've read like a thousand books at this point, Mm -hmm. not a thousand because back then there were only like two or three. Now there's tons. I'm so jealous of new writers. (laughs) So new writers write, you have no excuse. You should write. There are tons of guides on this. But back then I think I could only find like two or three. This was like back in when I decided to write a romance, like 2011. And I could only find like two or three books. Um, where it was just like how to write a romance novel. Mm -hmm. And I was super tentative about it, but as I became more confident and became more Theodora Taylor, it was just kind of like, well, I went into a lot of experimentation Mm -hmm. and I just kind of found that sometimes I like writing darker things and sometimes I like writing lighter things, but a lot of the, but I will say the most successful books (laughs) tend to be darker. So it's, it's interesting because, you know, that becomes a um, chicken and egg kind of thing. It's just like, oh, do you write darker because it's more successful and that's rewarding you? Or do you write darker because that? Um, because you're more attracted to that and you feel free to write pretty much whatever you want. So how many romances have you written? I think I I have not counted in a while, but I think I'm like at 37, maybe 38 at this point. Okay. And do you like, so do you like the direction that you're going in? Um, And I will say for those who are listening, um, it has gotten wildly successful (laughs) Um, (laughs) because when you're like, oh, she's in the top 10, well, there you are Um, (laughs) on Amazon. I'm like, oh, I know her or I knew her when, so (laughs) way back when in the day, but um, how, yes. So has it, how could, let me say this. What is it like writing? Okay, so the books are resonating, clearly. Um, mm-hmm. They're resonating with people. Do you know what it is about the books that you're writing now that resonates? Or well, let me say this. Do you think they resonate more? Or do you think it's just a matter of like building success and then more people hear of you? I think that it's thing? a matter of building success. I okay. honestly do. Um, you know, I think, I think all romance authors kind of cast their earliest books in a very romantic light. And they were just kind of like, well, not all. It's, I don't know, but part of me feels like, oh, I hope I'm a good enough writer. Maybe I was better at the beginning. Mm-hmm. I'm doing my best <laughs> right now. But luckily, I have an audience that's really deeply... Um, Rabid, yes. <laughs> yeah, and they're, they're really loyal, loyal mm-hmm. and they really want to read these kinds of stories. So I consider it a kind of mixing of kind of knowing I you know I write and the audience is always in the back of my head it's like I want to thrill them I really want them to enjoy this book I want them to be so entertained I want them to love this hero I want I want I want (laughs) and you know that's a lot that's a lot of pressure on myself but at the same time they uh, I'm gonna ramble I'm going to (laughs) ramble I'm trying to learn to stop myself before I ramble (laughs) okay and just stop 
and say and like make a succinct point. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to do <laughs> these days. It's a work in progress. But my main point being that I think the audience is growing with me. So it's just kind of like, well, um, it's kind of like parenting. Half the job is showing up. Right. <laughs> Keep yeah. on showing up. If you're there, if you're there all the time, then audiences will appreciate that. If you're consistent, audiences will pre- appreciate that. I'm not um, super consistent in um, in the kinds of things I write, but I am consistent in. Um, it's usually going to be a somewhat, it's going to be well-structured. It's going to be, (laughs) you know, somewhat humorous. It's going to have, oh my God, what just happened moments and stuff like that. So I think I, I I like to believe that I'm kind of, I, I always say um, you shouldn't be afraid of being a cookie cutter romance person or a hack because quiet as is kept one of the most successful television shows of all time is will of fortune (laughs) it's always close to saying i was thinking law and order but similar sort of thing like you know what it's gonna be right and i don't consider myself will of fortune but maybe family feud like (laughs) It's, Steve Harvey might say something crazy <laughs> or the characters might say something crazy, but you know, you know, family feud, right. family feuds a little wrong, <laughs> you know, from the first post. It, this is bad because you really have to understand like the family feud. If you watch family feud back in the eighties, the first host was bananas. Like he did all sorts of crazy things like kissing the contestant. Yes. Everybody had to kiss Richard like Dawson. That. I'll never forget it. Yeah. <laughs> So it's just kind of like, kind of like that. It's a little wrong, but it's super enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, you know, he totally couldn't get away with that today. I had never even thought about it, but not, yeah, no, you couldn't, Richard Dawson no. couldn't kiss all the women. Like there that wouldn't would, be Richard Dawson. There wouldn't be. <laughs> never. Oh, I have so many thoughts about that. I'm going to have to Google that later. Okay. So, cause I wonder what people, there's, I'm sure there's a good essay about how Richard Dawson could not exist today. Um, no, <laughs> absolutely not. I'm going to look that up. So, how did you, let me say this, what was it that influenced this, your delve into in universal fantasy? So I will, let me say this. So you often, you read a lot of books and then sometimes you make lists. Actually, you do make lists. Let me tell you when. You make lists of books that you have read that you think that other people should read. I have one on the back of a receipt from oh, like- Oh yeah, I guess I do tend to do that. <laughs> you do, like I had one on the back of like, I think a library receipt on my table for years and every every so often I'd cross out another one. And, I'd, <laughs> and I'd be like, well, Theodore recommended this and let me cross it out. And like, and so- I have those, you do make lists of things like that. So you, it, my perception of you is that you decide on a topic, whether it's like efficiency or like work habits or whatever it is. And then you read like 10 or 20 books on it. And then you recommend seven. Yes. And, and, <laughs> and so I have read like whatever, whenever you make these lists, I do actually read them all. Um, but I wanted to know if part of the influence about the universal fantasy came from Jen Barnes at all no oh wow okay (laughs) that was that was interesting because it was such serendipity so you know I gave the universal fantasy speech at um it for it's oh this is too much background but we did we have a group that we're in called the Indie Intensive. And Mm -hmm. before the pandemic, it was a wonderful group that met every year. And the whole deal of it is that we had to teach each other something we knew. And I remember it was my year and I was just like, well, I think I figured out how to sell books to people who are are outside my um, audience. So I did a soft I did a soft talk of uh, universal fantasy. It was super rambly, but somehow people were just like, that was good. (laughs) Like, and so then it was funny because Orange County asked me to be a um, featured speaker and they were, they asked if I could also teach a class and I said, well, I have this thing on universal fantasy. And then after that, and that speech went super crazy well, because, you know, I had podcasts and it was actually, I didn't ramble because I only had like 
45 minutes right. to get this done. <laughs> and then um, I went to Ram and I met Jim Barnes and then her speech blew me away. And someone was just like, oh, if that speech blew you away, check out her id thing. Right. And at that point, I was just like, you know, she's an academic. Right. She's so much better at saying things than I am. And maybe I should stop giving the universal oh fantasy God. speech because she really, the id thing was really great. Mm -hmm. And then, um, but then the issue was that after OC, like, I want to say Los Angeles booked me. And then directly after that Ram, Sky asked me to do this. It, it asked me to um, present at the next Ram. She was like, you know, that speech you gave at Indie <laughs> Intensive, oh, God. do that, but with numbers and, you know, <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 it's so much less rambly. I, you know, I can do this. And so, you know, and that's what happens. And so I did listen to it. I can't really tell you, um, the differences, I guess with it, it's more what you like, right. like, you know, when it's yes. just kind of like, well, she, her big example is like, oh, I love twins. I love da da da. I mm -hmm. love da da da. Universal fantasy is more about why you like what you like. Uh, so, okay. you know, I, for, if I were to attach it to it, I would say, well, I like twins. And the reason that people love twins and it's funny because I have twins. Right, you do. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> is because no one else, almost no one else is a twin. Right. It's a completely kind of alien experience. And what's interesting about having, I had one kid and then I had twins. And my oldest kid is, ex it can get very jealous of the twins relationship because it is insanely close. Right. It's just kind of like, they, for example, and this is one thing I find fascinating um I once asked one of my twins do you ever get lonely and she was just like no why would I oh wow <laughs> and so she she does not understand like the fundamentals of loneliness oh, wow <laughs> so it's just kind of like it is so it's crazy to me that someone has been with you from the womb Mm -hmm. Like, and when they were kid, and when they were really little, they used to like curl up, um, like they were still in the womb when they were very new, like you couldn't just split them. In right. fact, if you ever read a twin baby book, which I don't think you will, <laughs> no. you had to, like maybe twin grandkids or something <laughs> like that. One of the things they say is like, oh, you eventually have to split them up. <laughs> like you'll uh... just have to force it because they sleep so naturally curled up around each other to each yeah. other around each other so that to me is fascinating and that kind of in sync um relationship that nobody else has i think is why twins are universal fantasy that's so but, interesting yeah and also, also i guess because it that, cures loneliness which is people's people's like connectedness and belonging and that's the one yes. thing that people i don't want to say fear the most but it fear the most maybe <laughs> Well, I think they're fascinating for that reason. Right. And so, and then, you know, I think having a twin, I, I you know, I, twins aren't my thing. Although I do love, um, my first book featured like an identical twin. <laughs> it was very, you know, it was very workman romance. It was just like, well, he's an identical twin. <laughs> and the big twist Spoiler alert! <laughs> Don't read my first book. Is that she? He? She has amnesia, and she thinks he's the person she was with, but really, it was she. Me. His her boyfriend was the other was twin. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> <laughs> but now she's fallen in love with the bad twin, and you know the good and bad. I so I do love twins too. They're really interesting. Okay, so I see it. I get it now. Wow, I got to change how I write because you just plugged into all the things. It's like it's got a triangle and it's got amnesia and it's yes. got, you know, all of the things that you're like, okay, I want to know more. I, wow, I don't write like that at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, it... I don't. <laughs> and 
No, and perhaps my success is reflected in, in, in those themes. So I'll, I'll think about that more deeply tomorrow. It's the only thing I like about having low self-esteem. Like, I'm always concerned. <laughs> it's like, will you like this? Will you like me? Oh, that's it's like I don't take it for granted. And it's the and this kind of success and like kind of being like, oh, I want them to like it is probably the only good thing that has come out of my low self-esteem, my chronically low self-esteem, which I'm so always working on. Do you know I never think about readers when I'm writing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I'm telling myself a story and it takes a long time and I'm always <laughs> concerned with how long it takes. And then um, I'm done. And then later I think about readers only <laughs> because I'm like, oh, well, now that I've told myself this story, I would perhaps would like to sell it to more than three people. <laughs> And so, I perhaps other people would enjoy this, this story. story. Let me see how I'm going to do that. I'm actually thinking about it now. So I have a book coming out next week called Poisoned, which, so the problem is obviously I wrote the book, I don't know, six, nine months ago. We're going to get into that. We're not going to discuss that issue now at all. And now I have to like market it. And I'm just like, what? Like, I was like, well, this was interesting when I did it, but I, you know, in this, in the interim, I've written this other book that I like a lot more, but that's not coming out for like six more months. So now I have to go back and sort of gin up some interest in this book. Um, You write exactly opposite of how I write. I'm always just kind of like, whatever book is being released, it's hot off the presses. Like I just cooked that. (laughs) Like. I cooked that specifically for you. This is a special, this is a custom order. I just cooked that on the stove for you. Oh, that's you so go. funny. Cause I was just looking to see about, I have to check. I was checking for an editorial deadlines and I realized this book was done and edited in October. And oh, that's crazy. And it's, <laughs> and it's coming out next week. And so I obviously haven't thought about it deeply since I, and I've written other books. I've written like two other books since then. So, you know, it's not front of mind, although it will have to be. That's what I'm going to do tonight. I'm going to reread it so that I can talk intelligently about it. Um, So what is it that, okay, so let me ask you this. What are your future writing plans? Like, what is it, do you plan to continue on the same sort of path that you are now in terms of, I don't know, theory, theme, theme, theme. That's the word I want, theme. Um, or do you have something else in mind? Because you seem right in the thick of, it, it's going really well. So you're right in the thick of it. Um, but what are you thinking about future-wise? Because you do plan ahead for all that you're I saying. do. You're, I, you're I do. I'm number one futuristic. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I do plan wildly ahead. So I... Because you had a book, let's say, did your book come out two weeks ago? I'm so not good with time. Um, when did that book come out? That's crazy. It <laughs> feels like it? in the last... May 6th. Wow. Jeez Louise. That's insane. Oh, that right. is insane. That so came out on May 6th. I'm right. It is two weeks. I can I can count. Look at me. Woohoo. So what was the title of the book that came out? <laughs> um, it was the last in a trilogy. So oh. it was Victor, Her Roofless Husband. Okay. And what, what would you say the theme of that trilogy was? I have my thoughts, but you can see. Uh, the theme? Mm-hmm. It, this is the, okay. So that's the big problem for me. I read so many books and they were just kind of like, well, you should have a theme. Like what's your theme? And I never do. <laughs> it's just kind oh, of like, you know, that's so interesting. I always have so a theme. I it's- never have a theme and I always feel really bad about it. Cause it's just kind of like, I I would like, I don't know, I guess I don't want to write um, really, uh, I don't know, like it, it, it was basically like I wanted, it, so for me at least, stories are very, all the words have disappeared. That's so. okay. <laughs> I will not ask you about theme. Okay, I'll tell you this. So when I was in fifth grade, um, I switched schools. And the and one of the first things I had to do in fifth grade was write a book report. And they gave you like, I've got a mimeograph. I'm so old. They gave you a mimeograph sheet of the kind of things that you had to include. And the last one was theme. And I had never heard of theme before. And I had read like probably thousands of books by then even. Mm-hmm. And I'd never heard of theme. And I don't think I figured out theme until maybe college. Like it was a slow, it was this... It was the hardest thing to wrap my head around. I usually don't struggle with like a lot of things, but sort of that 
idea was the hardest thing um, to wrap my head around. But now it's something I think about all the time because I think I write around themes. So like in my books, the themes are always, well, they're always like redemption or <laughs> I write a lot of redemption. Um, look, she's not so bad. Um, but I mean, that's one of the things I continually write about. But what would you say then? So what is the story you're trying to tell then? Like, what is the bigger story that you think you're trying to tell through the romances that you've written? I'm not. <laughs> okay, maybe that's just me. It's, it's like, it, it, I'm honestly not. I honestly, with every story, it's just kind of like, you know, for example, with Victor, that book appeared to me and it was just kind of like, God, that's a big story. <laughs> I don't know that I have the attention span to tell that story. And so I always feel like the story kind of comes and it's just kind of like, there's a beginning and this is how it ends. And you're going to have to figure out the middle, but you know, the character, I always say that the characters present mm -hmm. and it's just kind of like, um, I had this one dragon shift to romance and I was visiting my family in St. Louis. We just had this lovely day at the botanical gardens, like in St. Louis. And they had all these lights up around the holidays and it was gorgeous. And, you know, we took pictures and then we went to the gift shop and I'm just looking for a, um, we collect all these um, snow globes. So I'm looking for a snow globe that hopefully to commemorate this great trip to St. Louis and then an image of a woman who is being given as a kind of sacrifice gift to a giant mm -hmm. comes to me. And I'm standing there in the middle of this gift shop and the next thing I know my husband is saying, is everything all right? Because I've just been standing there frozen. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> or like, for, apparently it looked really weird, but that it, But when I walked away, I was just like, oh, that's um, my dragon book. That giant is actually a dragon shifter. And that woman, the woman is from the future. And that's why she's large enough for what they would consider a giant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the book goes on from there. And then, you know, I, you know, I'm, I try to meditate a lot. And so a lot of things come to me while I'm meditating and stuff like that. So I fu very frustratingly have a, it, my um, writing is deeply connected to my relationship with the universe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so sometimes I'm just kind of like, oh, well, you know, they've told me to write this story, but they're not talking to me. <laughs> and oh, it's wow. very frustrating. Wow. Okay. Wow. So it's I, a lot more woo woo. <laughs> I write nothing like this. I don't even understand what you just yeah. said. <laughs> You're like, I'm going to end the interview now because <laughs> <it's> like, <laughs> this is the opposite of how I write. Wow. Um, yeah, no. So I sometimes I hear what other people write. I'm like, what's going on in your head? This is like when people describe to me, like, so at my son's school, there are a number of people who are musicians, like the writers I understand. And like the visual artists, I think I pretty much understand. I don't get it. Like I couldn't do it, but I understand it. But the musicians, like yeah. the, one of the parents in my son's class is a composer. Like he writes movie scores. And wow. Then, I know. And all I can think of is like, so you dropped your kid off and I dropped my kid off and you're going to go write a movie score and I'm going to go <laughs> home and like, you know, look at the baseboards and dust and then maybe write three words. And I just am like fascinated. But like what happens in a brain that produces something on the other end when it's nothing like anything? My brain doesn't work that way. Um, my brain is not, and I love music. I really feel like I should be able to write music. And my it, one of the funniest things that um, I said to my husband, I dated so many musicians. <laughs> so and, did I. It's a thing, but whatever. Way, that when I first met him, and, you know, we were dating for like three, I think it was on our third date. And I said, oh, so what instrument do you play? And he was just like, oh, I don't play an instrument. And I was just like, I mean, what instrument did you used to play before you started doing what you 
do. Right. And it was just like, I don't play any instrument. I was like, not even piano? She's like, no, I don't. My sister played piano and she was pretty good, but I don't play any instruments. And it took a absurdly long time for me to understand that this dude really plays no instruments. And so it was really funny because it was just kind of like, I think I just love musicians because they... I I wish that I could do music, but I think they think a lot more like I do. Mm -hmm. I think so too. Like, it's just, it reminds me of that. And I was like, oh, so there's, so something comes in and the magic comes out and I don't understand what happens in between. Yes. Um, I feel like it frustrates me a lot because I'm a practical person. (laughs) And so it's just kind of like, I don't like being this dependent on the universe. I would like for it to have (laughs) some kind of practical, I would like for it to be practical. Oh, that's so funny. I find I, I think of myself more as a journeyman. It's like plumbing. It's like, okay, so just like screw this part into this part and let's keep going. And every day I get, I feel like it's just like digging a ditch every day. I'm like, okay, so I'm going to yeah. get up and I'm going to put the shovel in and we're going to hope for the best. And then tomorrow, like, and at the end there will be a ditch, but it's just like every day is just a little bit and a little bit and a little bit, but there's no woo woo in my head at all. Well, that's quite frankly why it, that's for the rough draft. And right now I'm in a rough draft mode and mm. I hate it. And, you know, I'm, I'm getting through it. Don't feel sorry for me. No, I, you'll soldier through. <laughs> yeah, I will, I will soldier through the rough draft, but I love editing. I'm always just like, oh, you know, when you get through this rough draft, then you'll be able to edit it. And, you know, editing, I like being a journeyman. I, I, you know, wow. would like to be a journeyman, uh-huh. like being dependent and it's like, are, is you know, or feeling like you're disconnected from your story or Mm -hmm. that, you know, you're not um, serving it because you, you know, all writers have, I think, even if you're a journeyman or if you're a um, woo-woo writer, you have the feel, you do wake up some days where it's just like, duh, how do you write? Because it's hard. (laughs) Like, I'm going to tell you, maybe you don't have this, but okay. So at the beginning of a book, I have this grandiose idea. Yes. And it's going to be spectacular. Yes. You just wait. And then in the middle, I'm like, well, clearly I can't service this idea. I wish I could exactly. channel somebody who could come in and service yes. this idea because I didn't, I envisioned it being bigger or better or something different than what it is. And by the end, well, by the end, I'm just glad it's done. And I just have to think, well, this is the best I could do, but I always want it to be bigger. Like I have these, like, I, yes. I don't, I just want it to be like, magic and in the yes end, in the end it's my journeyman job and it's like well what yeah. happened to the magic i'm like don't know I've tried my best there ain't no magic and here you go <laughs> out of that pipe but <laughs> it was I, a big one yes yeah. but um, i just wish i could well I, this is just a wish like i think about this all the time i just wish it could be as magical as i want it to be sometimes i read books and i there's some authors i love and i read it and i was like well she makes the magic so why can't i make the magic um well, there's like no, I do. You like- know, what's interesting is like if I see someone and it's just kind of like I usually assume that if it's well written mm-hmm. that there's a lot of journeyman going on. Oh, and that's God. what's interesting. It's like magic plus journeyman <laughs> equals <laughs> really good book. But let me read you this quote from A Court of Thorns and Roses that I had to send to none of my Smithy friends other than you. You're my only writer Smithy friend. Okay. Wow. Which is crazy. Yeah. Right. (laughs) (laughs) The artists don't, and it's interesting because there's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of Smithy friend artists. That's actually true. Now that you say it and I have to think about that. That's true. Actually. (laughs) You're like, we don't necessarily. I mean, I have a lot of friends in entertainment, but I mean, they're just like, doing the thing like i'm producing this tv show like it's just you know it is what it is um let me see ask me another question while i look up this quote (laughs) interrupt you in the middle of the question okay and i'll be like (laughs) here we go yeah Um, (laughs) so and i'll be like i found it so what kind of so well let me say this 
what romance do you enjoy reading the most? Cause, so I'll say this. Like, I enjoy angsty. The thing I think I can't write, the thing I would like to write better. I love a good angsty romance. And I would love new adult more. But part of me as an older person wants to say to these people, you will not think this is a problem 20 years from now. So stop, like, you know, ruminating over it. <laughs> I'm like, I just want to shake them sometimes. I'm like, you're 21. Get over it. But okay. Um, but I do love angsty romance. I do love damaged heroines. I don't like damaged heroes. Um, that's interesting. The, the men have to come whole and they have to, like, women have to heal. I don't know. That's my own personal thing. Mm-hmm. So I love those books. Um, there's, like, Serena Bowen writes them well. Like, Sarah Mayberry writes them well. There's a couple of authors I just read and I'm like, Oh, this is this is just what I want. Look at her; she's she's such a mess, but she's really lovely inside. Just wait till you get to know her. Um, but what when you're reading romance, what is it you enjoy the most? Anything that is um, super interesting, super compelling, and usually that's stuff that's not like things that I would write. So I like um, lots and lots of male mail. I read so much male male romance. And then like, um, I read a lot of, um, I, I'm not pre- sure if I'm pronouncing this right. Yaoi, um, this is like this Japanese anime. It's also called like boys love mm-hmm. romance. And I love that. I love like, um, I, I love, huh, what else do I, I, I like angsty romance too, to a point, as long as it's not too long. Mm-hmm. Like I have a short, in- I have a short attention span. So if it's just like, oh man, and it, man, like, you know, you need to just suck it up. Figure this out. <laughs> I know. I can suck it up buttercup. Trust me. I think yeah. It like, you know, there's only so much miscommunication. If you're on like the 300th page and you're still not communicating, then I get really upset <laughs> or going back and forth. No, sometimes, and I, I can't believe I say this because I read this sometimes in romance, I think maybe you're not for each other. Yes. <laughs> I like you, but maybe you're not for each other. Um, that's so interesting. But what is it? Okay, so male male to me feels like, I don't know how to say this, a departure from the kind of traditional romance that was out in the 80s. But I imagine yeah. the themes are the same, so I'm not sure. But what is it that you like about it? Um, because it's different. Like, it's like, well... I'm not going to write this. I'm not going to. And, um, you know, that's funny. I've never, I've never stopped to analyze why I like male, male romance and it's hot. It's, I guess it's the same thing. Like why do men like lesbian porn Mm -hmm. and why do women like lesbian porn? (laughs) I don't know. Is, you know, why do people like lesbian porn? Like sometimes it's just like, Ooh, two men. Nice. Uh I want to watch in the like, and you know, I have a joke where I'm just kind of like, if I see two guys fighting, it's always just kind of like, or (laughs) you could have sex. (laughs) That would be hot. I love to watch that. And that's the only way I get through superhero films. <laughs> that's really, oh, that's so, I have so many thoughts on that. I will, I will spare, but okay. I, 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 I hear you. I hear you. That is so interesting. I don't here know. Here it I, is. Here it is. Here it is. Ding, okay. ding, 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 ding. Go ahead. At one point, the character, she's had this dream that she could just have enough time to paint and she's finally given the time to paint Mm -hmm. and it becomes really really frustrating because and here's the quote I never felt satisfied that my work matched the images burning in my mind and that line cut me so deep (laughs) I was just like That's exactly exactly it. It, that's exactly what it is. It's like I yeah. have this beautiful like Monet picture, and what it comes out is mm-hmm. is like a bad sort of copy that you could frame in a and you know, a bad poster and <laughs> framed in like plastic. And it's like she tried, but she didn't make it. It's just so I it's, know the same the same the Monet. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I just think I just like well, I tried, and that's the thing. I actually I, I well. I, I you know, let's say 20 something books in I've come to the determination that that's what it's going to be I've tried this is my best I think it's okay and we're just gonna move on like I don't know if I'll ever make that magical book I think about it all the time though I think well maybe the next one um well it's funny because like the closest I ever come is when 
I is often a surprise to me. <laughs> like, you know, some of some of the bestsellers, it's just like, okay, I'm releasing this and I think this is awesome. And the fans agree, like, yeah, this is awesome. And mm-hmm. it's great when that comes through because then it's like, oh, I know exactly how to market this to you. This is the book. You're going to be super entertained. And then there are some books where I just kind of slide it in and it's just kind of like, and then fans come back like, no, we love this. We love this. We love this. We love mm-hmm. this. And, you know, and then it's very intimidating to write the next book because it's like, well, I don't, the, like the closer you get to a quote unquote perfect book, mm-hmm. the the harder it is to write the next one. So part of me feels like we're on this journey to toward self-love and obviously I see it differently because I have my relationship with self-esteem or whatever. (laughs) And so like this process was put, um, I'm being put through this process again and again and again to like finally feel like, well, whatever you do, it's good enough. And, you know, you did your best. As long as you do your best, it's good enough. And to accept that and to like kind of let go of the idea of perfection. Oh, I just, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I, <laughs> like that's not why. <laughs> no, I think I just sent a quote to like Marina, uh, Marina Maddox and, and Maggie Moore about perfection um, because I struggle with it mightily. Mm-hmm. And I think I just sent them this whole long thing. I will forward it to you in a little bit. Um, oh, but I sent this whole forwarded thing about perfection because it's, it's the thing I battle, which is why books are on my hard drive, which is a different conversation. So I'm going to ask you this taboo question that, um, so years ago, um, when my second book was released, um, I was at some function and I was with this author, um, Lynn Marshall. I don't know if you've ever met her. She lives up here, but she said to me, she was like, you look pained when you were talking about that book. And I was like, I don't like the book. Um, and she was like, don't ever tell people you don't like the book. And I, I, I'm going to tell you something. The horror of that book is that it sells better than a whole bunch of other books. Oh, yeah. And, Absolutely. and I was like, well, I can't replicate it because I didn't even like it in the first <laughs> place. Um, but that's a whole different conversation. Do you have a favorite book of yours? Because I have two. Somebody asked me recently and I have two that I love deeply. Maybe three. OK, three that I love deeply. The other 22. Eh. So, <laughs> <laughs> like literally. Yeah. Eh. <laughs> Uh, my favorite book is actually Her Viking Wolf because it was really hard. It was my first like super hard, super hard um, book that I had to turn in on a deadline. It's the first time, you know, I even had any trouble meeting a deadline. Mm-hmm. And then um, people got it. And I was really concerned that the appetite wouldn't be there for a time traveling um, Viking werewolf right. or <laughs> interracial romance. And people loved it. And, you know, it was my first, like, oh, wow. It, it also was the book that made me feel like I can really do this for a living. Mm -hmm. Like this is going to be okay. I can do this for a living and I'll keep on making books and, you know, hopefully get even better. But, you know, people just really responded to it. And that was so great. It was just so great. That is so interesting because the books I like, okay, two of the three that I really like of mine um, were easy to write. And I struggled mightily, like sitting down to write a book. Like it's, it's, it's like an act of Congress. I mean, you know, I look at that mm. and I think, well, they can't pass a law and I can't write a page. So we're good. We're like, we're, cop- <laughs> <laughs> we're like copacetic. But has there ever been a book that you sat and wrote that was effortless? Um, yes, His Pretend Baby. And it's one of my best sellers mm-hmm. of all time. Like I literally wrote it like we were um, taking a car trip on the way to um, St. Louis to visit my family. And then we're going to go to Texas to visit my husband's family. And then we're going to drive back to California. And um, I was just like, well, what am I going to do on this road trip? And then it occurred to me, oh, I could um, see if I could write a whole book. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, this, and so I wrote like a whole book. And so I got back on my road trip and I remember Um, We always go to Las Vegas for my birthday in January. Mm -hmm. And so we went to Las Vegas about two weeks later for my birthday. And I, on the 
trip there, I ed- I started editing this book. And then I edited it for like maybe a week. I sent it off to my editor. Like nothing was due. There was no pressure. Uh In fact, this was what was crazy. I was supposed to turn in her Russian brute. It was on (laughs) pre-order. And I stopped everything. Like literally I was writing her Russian brute. But then I was like, well, I'm going on the road. And, you know, I don't think I'm going to write Russian brute on the road. Uh So what should I do? And so I wrote his, his pretend baby. And to this day, that is like a perennial bestseller. It's crazy. That is so interesting. Um, I'm trying to think. One of the books I wrote, I wrote easily <laughs> sells well, and one of them doesn't. So <laughs> who knows? Um, but there, it's it is so rare that I, I I wish they were all like a pleasure. But there's like one book I sat down. The story had been in my head for some time, and I sat down, and from beginning to end, every day it was a pleasure. There was no block. There was no time where I didn't know it was going to happen. Oh, nice. I know, but it was one. <laughs> like. I wish there were more of those, but it was such a joy to write. And actually, I'm not even reaching for that on any given day anymore because I don't. I think that that's a, a rare occurrence. And so, if another one happens yeah. like that, yay! But I have no. I'm not sitting around waiting for the muse to strike. That's for sure. I just get up and yeah. do the thing every day. Do you think that you will write something other than romance in the future? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. I actually have a plan to. Um, so I was like, by the new moon, I'm looking at my little post-it mm-hmm. and it says, begin doors of the universe slash supersonic series by the new moon of May, 2022. So, oh, wow. Okay. So you yes, have a plan. Yes. Yes. It's on an orange post-it note. So it has to happen. It has now. to happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, you should but, put it on an orange post-it note. <laughs> maybe <laughs> I should open happen. my drawer and take those out. Right now I'm just using old post-its. I have the r- most random collection of um, a swag that I never gave away, but it's like one, like half of a post-it stack. And I was like, well, I can't put that in a box for, for years. <laughs> so I'm just going to use them up. Um, I have a couple of those. Um, so that's what I'm doing now. That is so interesting. So you have, well, you're futuristic. So you have plans. Wow. Yeah. I, I can't think beyond the next book. <laughs> That's interesting. It's funny. I'm doing, um, uh, so for, we're talking, I should say that we're talking about the strengths class with, um, classes with um, Becca Sai. Mm-hmm. And she right now has a secret, what she calls a secret menu class, mm-hmm. or she does an intensive for a week and it's on futuristic. Oh, and wow. on the first day, and I haven't gotten to the rest of the days because I've been just super busy, but um, on the first day, it was really, she was just like, futuristics often have to understand that other people don't have futuristic. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's a very natural way of being to them. And they, and she was like, what's funny is like, she had, um, it, that she's coached so many people who had futuristic in her top five. And then they were just like, but I don't have futuristic. And then when she asked them a little bit about their career, they talked in futuristic ways, oh, had wow. everything planned out and stuff like that. And so they didn't think they had futuristic because it was just such a natural way of being. And I remember when I um, got it, it, it explained a lot and it really helped with my relationships. <laughs> the I know, this is so interesting. I think, okay, so Becca Sime comes up a lot on this podcast. Um, yes. Maybe even more often than you, but you only by- You should Becca Sime. <laughs> oh my God, you're right. I'm writing this down now. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't think of that. Um, but only by a hair. So it's you and Becca Sime, the two people that come up the most. And then after that, I think it's Jen Barnes. So I think the three of you have had such a huge influence on us. But the thing I- Okay, so I love Becca Syme, and the reason I, I can't believe I'm saying this because at post forty I should have thought of this, but when I when I took one of her classes, the thought never occurred to me that other people thought differently. Like yes. I was just so like one of my top is um, discipline. Um, I think I was the highest number, but she finally found a number one discipline. But mine is all like discipline, deliberative input. So I'm just mm-hmm. like, I don't understand why people don't take information in and then get up every day and just execute one thing at a time. Yes. And yes. I was like, I was like, I'm so confused as to why you're like fluttering around over there. You know, if you just sit down and <laughs> just and just do it every day, it'll get done. And I didn't and then when we when she gave us, you know, we all did this like maybe a couple of years ago, and when she gave all the results, I was like, Oh, 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 other people think differently. I think yes. we, I think we were all in Texas and I was sitting with you, not you, Angie Fox and other and it was just the first time I was like, Oh. 
wait. And she was describing how she thought. And I was like, does, does that work? Like, did your head work? Like, I got to like look at her. I was like, but you're driving a car and you like got on a plane and you write books. So clearly like something comes out on the other end. But I had never considered that other people thought differently, um, which is, you know, I should have thought that maybe when I was like in my teens. I don't know what I was thinking up until well, now. Well, that's why the class was, uh, when I say like life changer, mm-hmm. it was just kind of like, oh, just that little thing alone is just kind of like, oh, you have this, this, and this, mm-hmm. and other people do not have it and the like. And so I get very easily frustrated. And then it was funny because um, now if you go back, I don't know when you took the class, but if you go now, um, they have very specific to your strengths um, breakdowns of each of your top five. Uh... and. Okay. I have always had trouble keeping a job. <laughs> it's just kind of like, what would happen is I would usually quit in a storm or, you know, I would find a way to have to quit. Like I would apply to grad school or anything <laughs> yeah. to have a good job and the like. And um, finally, I had a job at a radio station. I was writing America Top 40, American Top 40 with Ryan Seacrest. And it was a great job. It was like mm-hmm. during the height of um, American Idol. Idol. Yeah. And I got all sorts of perks. My boss was just the best boss in the world. It, like really upped my writing, taught me how... It, I learned a lot about writing fast and well then. Mm -hmm. And um, I absolutely, by the time I was done, hated it. And it was just kind of like, I don't want a boss. Like, I cannot have a boss. A boss. And so, you know, I was kind of like living with this, like, oh, I can't work with other people. And it made me feel, you know, a little lesser, like there's something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. And then when I saw the breakdown of the top five strengths, it was just kind of like, you know, a lot of people don't have futuristic, so you might be frustrated in a group setting. You might have trouble working with other people. And my second one is focus. And they're like, a lot of people don't have focus. Oh, no, I don't have. I think all the things you're talking about are in the bottom right. for me. And I was like, I don't even yeah. know what these colors are because my colors are all the same at the top. <laughs> but no, but it, I, OK, so it's given me a little bit, wait, well, not a little bit, a lot more empathy and compassion for other people because I was like, oh, they're just yes. not looking at this the same way. And I was just yes. and for years, I was just endlessly frustrated with people. I was like, just sit down and work. Like, why can't you just sit down? Like, right. just do it. Cause that's what you do. Like you just do it. And if you do a little bit every day, then it'll be done. It's like, if you just work out every day, you'll like be buff. Like I, I never could understand why people couldn't just understand the incremental part. And then Beck is like, but you know, other people don't have this. And I was like, Oh, gotcha. Yes. <laughs> Gotcha. Like I don't have discipline. That's that's one of my jealousy strengths. Although we're not supposed to be jealous, <laughs> I would love love discipline. I don't mind it. Like I'm gonna be honest. Like I don't mind it because when I look at what it can get you in the world, I don't mind mm-hmm. it. I don't mind it because people are like, "Oh, I can't save," and I'm like, "But if you just save a little bit every day, like I have a whole lot of things that, <laughs> that I do. Like if you just do this a little bit every day, then you know, 20 years from now, you will have." Um, but I get it that that's not a thing for other people. Um, but I don't mind it. Um, do I wish I was more strategic? I don't know. Maybe (laughs) like I, you know, I look at things and I think, I always wonder how people like execute bigger things or have different ideas or think about the future. And I'm thinking about, Oh my God, I'm just like next week (laughs) (laughs) and the week after that. And I have to buy plane tickets and I'm already struggling with that because that already seems too far away. Um, and that's funny and I have to buy them because apparently you can't just show up at the airport if I could I'd I'd be that I'd totally be that person I'd be like okay well I'm ready to go now (laughs) (laughs) and they'd be like did you plan I'm like I'm so sorry but um that's fascinating strategic oh Jesus focus I don't even I don't I think that there may be like 35 and it's not even on my list right (laughs) yeah Oh, that's funny. It's it's interesting because discipline and focus, th- what a power pair that would be. They like, would. You know, oh I, wish, I wish I had focus. So I have yes. discipline, but I only can do everything in five minute increments because that's about my focus. And so like I'll walk away and then come back and then I'll be like, oh, what was that again? If there was something such as this, I would like hire someone to be outside discipline for me to be like, <laughs> well you know, sit down and focus. Cause once I focus, I'm great, Mm -hmm. but you know, getting to that focus is the um, issue. So I would love like someone who was like a personal trainer who would just come and sit there and be like, are you focusing? 
like just treat me like a baby. <laughs> okay, so um, my last question, I think, is um, what is the next book that you have coming out? Oh, the next book is still part of my Roofless Triad series. It's called Han. Um, <laughs> I'm not ready to talk about it. You don't have to. <laughs> you, you don't have to. I um. Oh wait, I'm gonna... Han, her Roofless Mistake. Okay, and then okay, one last other question. You really like editing? <laughs> Sorry. I love editing. Oh. That's my favorite part. I hate writing. I love editing. Oh my God. Like, it's interesting. If I weren't creative and I weren't receiving stories, I would be an editor. Absolutely. Like, is, and it's probably if I ever, if I ever get through this DMV line of stories <laughs> that I have waiting, waiting to um, be told, I will probably become an editor. And it's what makes it hardest for me to read. <laughs> It's just kind of like, because I have a really, I'm a really, really good editor. <laughs> so it's like, I'll be reading a book and it's just like, oh, <laughs> you could do this or you could do that or this wow. isn't working. So I write clean drafts, which is why it's probably moves so slowly because I hate editing. And it's the last thing I ever, ever want to do today. I had to, I opened edits for a novella that I got back apparently six weeks ago. <laughs> Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, because I just don't I want to tell the story once and then I want to be done with it I don't ever want to revisit it so I can only do it as I do it so I I I have a whole process that I edit as I write because I can't I can't go back and then when I finish the book it takes two days I did it a couple weekends ago it takes two days where I have to do nothing but edit because I can only hold the story in my head for that period of time oh wow Um, I can't hold a whole book in my head. I don't know how people do it. So I can only hold the whole story in my head for like two days. And so I literally had to like sit down and not do anything else, like not eat, not get up, not go to the bathroom, do nothing, but edit because that's the only, that's as much as I could dedicate to that. And I will never be able to dedicate it to that again. Um, So I find it interesting because I just would not, I don't do it. Like I don't do it. It's like, I just write so slowly so that I can like make it perfect. So they don't ever have to change it. Well, that works too. Like sometimes I'm just kind of like, oh, it'd be nice if I could write a little slower. And but if I write a little slower, then I fall into deep depressions <laughs> and stuff like that. Because I hate roughing so much. It just makes me um, feel unsure of myself. And I wonder why I write. And then, you know, I'm just kind of like, like maybe I should get another job oh, <laughs> so, trust me. rather than finish this rough draft. Oh, well, but I think we all have those moments. Like I was, so the last book, okay. So I was, re- I was watching a Brene Brown Ted talk the other day. Cause I have that kind of time right now. And <laughs> she was talking about creativity in the dark middle. And she described it so well that like, if you're creative, all you have to do, there's always a point at some project where you're like, I can't see the end. I have no idea yeah. how it's going to come about, but let me just do this. And that describes pretty much every everything from word 20,001 to the end of a book for me. Like the, <laughs> the first few chapters, I'm delighted. I'm like, this is the best job ever. And then I was sitting there last week thinking, well, I haven't written a resume in 20 years, but I could. And I was like, but what would I do? And I started speculating. Yeah, exactly. I was like, well, I've been out of the job force for so long. Like at what point would people be like, what have you been doing? You know? and, <laughs> and, and I had all those thoughts. And then I was on this website looking at how to write resumes and how to deal with job <laughs> I'm not joking. And then I was no, like, this seems, this seems logical to me. This feels logical to me. I and love then, it. And then I was like, oh, well maybe if I just finish this book <laughs> and then I, you know, I got out of the, the funk, but I don't think that there, I, I haven't met a writer who hasn't had that dark middle moment where yes. you're just like, well, all is lost. Like not only is all is lost in the book, but all is lost in my head. Like I just, yes. it's interesting that the book will get written. Like I only like, so I have another book now that's half written. I didn't do well in 2020. I half wrote three books and I finished two and I have to finish the third one, but it's at like, I don't know, 28,000 words. And every time I think about opening it, I think, what the fuck? Like, I just like, mm-hmm. this is, it's in the middle. I don't know. Like, I don't know. It just seems like a mess that it, maybe I should set on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should set it on fire as opposed to editing. <laughs> as opposed to that. Like I just, um, I will eventually, obviously, as an adult, I sit down, I will deal with it, but not right now. <laughs> not right well, it's now. interesting. Um, though, 
one thing I went to school for dramatic writing Mm -hmm. and I remember um, I just didn't turn in an assignment and uh, my professor, the head of our program was just kind of like, what, what happened? And I said, well, I, I'm trying to fix it and I just don't know what's going on and I can't figure out how to fix it. And, um, you know, and that's what's happening. And we're like in the class, which is like eight students. Cause it's like, you know, a small grad program. Uh-huh. And then he says, and it's funny. Cause my friend Cal lives in um, LA. Hey Cal. <laughs> <You're really laughs> um, and he was just like, okay, Cal, <laughs> Cal, uh-huh. um, you read this draft of, of um, her play. And he told me, Hey, you send it to Cal and he gave me the best advice of my life, which is if you don't know what to do, give it to somebody else. <laughs> like oh. if you're, and it is funny because I've found myself in those kind of situations. And often I've learned that I need to like walk my butt upstairs and like talk to my husband and just spew at him mm-hmm. while he sits there with his coffee and it's like, well, it's just never going to work because how is he going to do this? And why would he even do that? And everyone's going to ask about why he would even do that. And I guess the only way to, f- way to figure that out is if this, this, and that happens <laughs> and the solution <laughs> magically downloads into my head. And I feel that the best novels are when I'm not resistant to just walking up the stairs. And doing that. <laughs> That's, and sometimes like getting to that point where you're just like, Oh, I, I need to go for a walk upstairs. Oh, that's so that's it's, that's true. It's true. It's true. And it, the thing is like, I, after the first book, which was like torture, I realized that there is always an, a, the other side, but the, the, the darkness is dark. Yes. <laughs> the darkness is dark. Well, you know, it's interesting it's interesting cuz you know, to get into deeper subjects, one of the things that really upsets me about mental illness in this country is it's so inaccessible and like the thing about darkness is it feels really complete when you're inside of it Uh and it doesn't feel like it ends and stuff like that and you literally need sometimes someone to help you out of it and like kind of getting to that point it takes it it took a lot of therapy just for me to get to that point (laughs) (laughs) hey I need help. And so it's interesting. So I really dislike that sometimes, not sometimes, a lot of times therapy comes at such a barrier price or it it requires so much effort for the people who need it. Especially right now during a pandemic. Like, trust me, I was thinking about it this morning. So therapy is probably the best thing that I ever did for myself in my entire life life um and I still do it every week I think it's been like maybe four years I don't know but it's the absolute best it's can I tell you I can see the light like I was thinking about it this morning and without her like I don't know if I would have sort of figured out the littlest things like I just want to be vulnerable and brave and have self-compassion that's it it took me four freaking years to just get to that but I, I was like oh that's it like that's what I need um but I I wish therapy for everyone. I do. I really do. I, 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 I wish it for everyone because I think it's super helpful to have somebody reflect back to you what you need to see. Yes. You know what? I, I'm going to send you a, um, a YouTube video I watched breaking down soul for character. And it was just kind of like, character want versus character need and how that creates natural conflict in the story Mm -hmm. but it was really interesting have you seen the movie soul no from pixar Mm -mm. oh okay so i'm going to send it to you you watch it Mm -hmm. and you'll be like oh this this movie's okay (laughs) it's all all right (laughs) you know it's i've seen better and then you'll watch this and you'll realize why it's brilliant and then it will really make you see that in your life although you figured it out it figured it out and so after I watch this I think a lot now about when I say to myself well I want this you know like because a lot of my career has been based on want Mm -hmm. like it's like oh I want people to like it I want people I want to you know 
get to the Amazon top 10, mm-hmm. which that was crazy. Congratulations. To see Thank you. <laughs> and, you know, I want, I want, I want. And then, you know, it's hard to figure out what you need mm-hmm. in the life. And so what, after I watched that, I was like, oh, you know, this is what you want, but what you need is like, you know, self-love, you need more self-compassion, like you said, Um, you need to be able to ask people for help when you need it. Like I have tons of problems asking people outside of my husband for help. Mm -hmm. My husband might be my husband because (laughs) I have easy time (laughs) asking him for help. It's just like, well, I'm willing to ask you for help. So you will be my husband. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah. Well, thank you so, so much for taking the time to speak with me today. I can't no. tell you enough. It's been... Thank you for inviting me. You know, I always love speaking with you. So this was just the highlight of my month. So thank you. And you know, the pandemic, I haven't seen you or anybody else. I know. It's the weirdest it's so thing. It's so crazy. It's so crazy. And, you know, I really want to choose to be an introvert who <laughs> doesn't see people very often and the like. But yeah, the, it's been life-changing, this pandemic pandemic and it's I think kind of still going on but I guess there's a light <laughs> at the end of the tunnel I feel that there was a light at the end of the tunnel um, yes. but thank you so much for speaking with me Theodora Taylor it's been a delight oh thank you thank you for having me This has been A Time to Thrill with me, your host, author, Amy Austin. If you enjoyed it, I hope you'll share, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. It will help others to find and listen to my conversations with brilliant creators. Also, please hit the subscribe button on your podcast app. In addition to hosting this podcast, I'm also the author of the Casey Court series of legal thrillers. They're available wherever books are sold, your local library, and also an audiobook. You can follow me on Instagram at ThrillerPod, find me on Facebook at Casey Court Series, or A Time to Thrill. Thanks for listening, and I'll be back with you soon with more great conversations.